Big tech has been shrinking its real estate presence either by subleasing space, pausing new construction, or letting leases expire. For instance, Google paid $1.8 billion in exit charges on leases last year to optimize its global office footprint. Joining us now to walk us through the commercial real estate market is Don Peebles, the Peebles Corporation CEO and Chairman Don. It's good to have you this morning. Good to be here. Um, we're four years out from, I guess, the, the, you know, the, the, the lockdown moment, and we've been waiting for commercial real estate to either rationalize or whether it's going to get worse or we're going to get through the problems and work it out on the financing side. What are the trends today in terms of companies rethinking how much space they need? Well, all companies, most prudent companies, and especially the larger ones, have reconsidered how they do business and how their employees work. And that was happening before COVID. Um, law firms were doing hoteling where no one got an assigned office anymore. And, they, uh, and you had larger corporations doing that. And, uh, and then COVID just accelerated it. And also what's happening also is in the tech sector, their business is being more efficient. It's all about being more efficient. So you can expect them, uh, historically, companies grow, and then they kind of level off and downsize a bit because they could be more efficient. What's hurting um, the real estate industry also is that with these losses in terms of occupancy is the interest rates have more than doubled. Yeah. And that has made these buildings essentially almost all of them in major cities insolvent. Well, which is exactly, I think, part of the point here of why that sector in particular really feels as if Fed rate cuts would be instrumental to maybe easing the pressure uh, a bit. But I guess is it a question of we can kind of, you know, the, the banks seem to be at a point where whatever losses they might have to take uh, are not necessarily crippling. Uh, but it doesn't mean that this is, these are attractive new investment opportunities. There's still an overhang of space. As an investor, as a developer, how are you thinking about what it's going to take right now to unlock these markets? Well, one of, the, one of the things, I do think that the risk is far greater than people are looking at. If we go back, we haven't seen anything like this since the early 1990s. And at that point in time, one-third of the 3,000 SNLs and savings banks around the country were closed. Within three years, 370 banks were closed. What's happening here is 80 plus percent of these commercial real estate loans are held by local and regional banks. They are the lifeblood to small entrepreneurs, emerging businesses and, and startups. And without access to that capital, none of them can make loans. They're banks who were dominating real estate markets on a regional basis who are making no loans. And the reality is they're just they're deferring judgment day. Yeah. Um, these properties are being given back now. Private equity funds are writing down their investments in office buildings to zero. And they are moving on because the intellectual brain drain to try to solve an insolvable problem where their equity is gone, they'd rather just take the losses and move on. Those properties are going back to the banks. And if the Fed does not drop rates, these buildings, I mean, are, I mean there will be a catastrophic, I, I, I believe, events going back to these local regional banks. We're going to have John Gray on in just a little bit from Blackstone. I don't know if you followed BREIT, for example, which mm -hmm. is a, a sort of semi-liquid fund. Mm -hmm. They have not uh, dropped their valuations nearly to the same level as most REIT products. Now, those funds, for the most part, are doing it almost at a, it's almost like at, at, uh, if you had a liquidate, liquidation prices. How do you think about the distinction between some of these funds now, these public funds that are out there, at, at much higher valuations than maybe where things would be today if, if you actually had to sell some of these, these properties? Well, well, John's one of the smartest people in real estate that I've known, and I've known him throughout his career. They're great investors. And Blackstone invests in real estate very differently than most um, real estate investment funds because they do it to a very large scale. And they are buying more, more, more likely buying companies or large pools of assets as opposed to one-off. And so that gives them the ability to be much more flexible. They're buying at better price points. And so their losses won't be as great. So I think that, and also they have the capacity to work their way through it, spin off the assets like they did with Biomed and other things. And so I think there's a way out for him. And I think, look, they've said this, and I've been saying this for a while. You don't know when the bottom of commercial real estate is coming. Um, and so you've got to start looking at when there's strategic buying opportunities. And that's one of the things that we're looking at. I think that they do need to make some adjustments to some of their asset values, but, I, but, but not to the same degree that these um, funds who are closed in funds and that they now are going to be compelled to sell. And I think that's another element here, because I think the values today are down. But I think right. if you can work through. But you think they should lower. I mean, we'll talk to John about this. Yeah. You think they should be lowering some of their values? Yeah, slightly. Yeah, I do. Uh, 
uh, you know, we keep hearing about private credit being kind of the escape hatch here. There's all this dry powder out there. The banks don't want to step in. Um, I know you're involved to some degree. Is that really going to uh, allow us to, to, to bridge to the, to the other side here? Yeah, I think so. Look, I mean, we, we uh, started a company called Willowbrook Partners because um, we think it makes a lot of sense for us to deploy capital to entrepreneurs. As an entrepreneurial development firm, one of our biggest challenges has always been to capitalize our projects efficiently, especially uh, acquiring land or developing new buildings. And even before COVID, before the run-up in rates, the private credit firms, um, you know, like Mac, um, like Related even had one, and of course, Children's Investment Funds, they were stepping into the market and filling the void that the major banks who were subject to Basel III um, were penalized to make these loans. So now, with rates as they are, and the inability of many of these banks because of capital constraints to make these types of loans, private credit will be the dominant player in commercial real estate in terms of growth going forward. Um, you know, Mike Milken was at one of the conferences about two years ago, and then last year here in New York in one of our meetings, um, he was talking about how that is the future. And I, be, and I don't think just commercial real estate. Um, I think that in terms of other industries, you'll see private credit emerge as a, in a much stronger player because they're liberated from these ridiculous regulations and they can make business decisions. And I think that's where banking should be, is making business decisions. Yeah. It's